All right, I'm hoping I'm live and I'm just going to check the lounge to see if anyone is watching us. Um, let's have a look. If anyone's seeing this live, please uh, go ahead and do something in the, in the, in the little text box uh, so I know that you are seeing me and then I'll be calling in our contributors. So, oh, we've got a chat. That's great. Oh, it's B saying you're live. Great. Okay, so I'm going to turn off my YouTube and my Facebook and just trust that we are going to stay live. So um, if you are watching this, welcome. If you watch it uh, later, then welcome again. Um, I'm live streaming now to YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn, and also to the Animas Lounge. So if you're an Animite in our Facebook group, welcome. Uh, hoping to have a great 90 minutes with you. So the, the aim of this session this evening is to explore the issue of um, trauma within coaching. And I've got uh, four excellent guests I'll be talking to around their opinions, their ideas, uh, their suggestions, uh, perhaps their cautions as well around what trauma means within coaching and how we work with it. Um, we are sadly missing one of our guests, David Lins uh, Linford Smith can't attend for personal reasons, I'm afraid. So we won't, we won't have David here. Um, before I bring in the four guests, I just want to give a bit of context for this, this um, round table. I've been a coach now for around about 20 years or so. Um, and for the vast majority of that time, 16, 17 years or so, trauma just didn't seem to feature as an issue within coaching. It just seemed to be something that existed somewhere else. It was not something I as a coach was educated in. It wasn't something I really thought too much about. It didn't seem to come up in my coaching sessions, as far as I could tell, at least. Um, and yet in the last couple of years, there's been a real increasing um, focus on the issue of, of coaching, uh, of trauma within coaching. And increasingly a, a, an attraction, I would say, maybe that's the wrong word, but an interest um, in trauma within the coaching field. And it, it, it kind of leaves certain questions um, that we need to begin to think about, such as, well, what does it mean to work with trauma? What kind of competencies do you need to, ha to have to work with trauma? Um, should all coaches be working with trauma or at least prepared to work with trauma? Uh, if not, why not? And what are the ethical issues? So there's a lot of kind of big questions hovering around this uh, particular topic. I myself am not trauma informed in any significant way. I've read plenty of stuff that gives me a flavor of it, but I wouldn't say in any way that I'm trauma educated. And um, I've also had a, I've also expressed concerns around the growing interest in trauma within the coaching field. Um, I recently described it as being like the bright yellow flower in a field of green that lots of coaching bees are flying to. And it does concern me a bit. I wonder what the shadow is that it might be pointing to or maybe it's not a shadow and it's just a sign of the times we're in that trauma is such a big thing. So it's certainly something I'm fascinated to dig into and I'm not an expert. In fact, I would say that my qualification for running this round table this evening is that I, I haven't got a clue, which means I'm prepared to ask the stupid questions that perhaps you're wondering about too and haven't kind of felt the, the courage to ask other people in case you come across as a bit daft. Well, I'm that daft person, so don't worry. We'll get these things answered tonight. Um, I, I was recently um, having dinner with Simon Weston, and he, he wrote a book, great book called Critical, um, Critical Text on Coaching. And he distinguishes between the wounded self and the celebrated self and makes a very clear distinction between the idea that the wounded self is the, uh, the realm of the counselor stroke therapist and the celebrated self is the realm of the coach. And I do feel that trauma begins to, to raise questions around that divide. And again, fascinated to see what the guests have to say. The way, this is my first live stream ever, so apologies if anything goes wrong. Hopefully it won't do. Um, but the way we're going to run it is about 90 minutes of conversation. We've got some fundamental questions we want to address, and I'll be just simply asking the questions, drawing in the guests, and seeing where it takes us. But hopefully we'll get through all of the key questions. I think that's what I need to say. So what I'm going to do now is bring the guests in and have them briefly introduce themselves, and then we'll get cracking. So let me introduce Fiona Wadworth. Wadworth, sorry, Fiona. Uh, Beatrice Zona. Dot Yankun. -kun. Is that correct, Dot? Am I saying your name correctly there? Yankun? Yankun, yeah. Almost, mm -hmm. almost correct. Great. And uh, Pete White. So um, let's go and have a brief intro. Fiona, would you like to start? Yes, hello. Um, it's really nice to be here. Um, my background um, began life as a social worker in um, child and family care. And um, I then moved into child and adolescent mental health services about 15 years ago. So I feel like I've been working in and around trauma for a very, very long time. Um, but really, it's in the sort of last 15 years working in, in 
children's mental health services um, that I've really got a good sort of flavour of, of the work and, and what's needed in a therapeutic sense. So I describe myself now as a, a, a mental health consultant, a therapist and also recently graduated coach. Um, that was last year. Um, my current role um, is especially sort of trauma um, focused. I work in a local authority with children in care. Um, I do a lot of mental health consultation and training with social workers, foster carers, schools, and also some therapeutic direct work with the children themselves. Great. Thank you so much, Fee. That's some excellent uh, context for us. Let's bring Dot in. Well, hello. Um, I said it last time when we were practicing a little bit. Um, I think I might be the the view of the the viewers right now because I'm just recently kind of graduated from Animas. Uh, I'm almost an Animite. I just sent it in my case study. <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, I'm also a certified intuitive eating counselor. This is why you see these lovely books right here. So I'm an anti-diet professional working with people ditching the diets and, you know, finding out who they are after and stuff like that. So what I quickly realized is that um, most of the people I work with are traumatized in any in, in different capacities. But um, yeah, so I started this year, <laughs> my big, big journey towards becoming a trauma therapist with the first little steps. So yeah, this is my, my thing. Oh, and I have this lovely little accent because I'm half German. So now you can pinpoint it. Okay, thank you. Let's get Beatrice in. Hi, thanks, Nick. Um, I'm Beatrice Zornek, and I'm a career coach. So in my coaching practice, I work with people in career transitions. And I'm also a certified supervisor in private practice and also um, as part of the faculty here at Animas. Uh, where I um, help coaches in training with um, supervision. And I have a, a few particular areas of interest in my practice. Um, the highly sensitive person or HSP personality trait, which um, I am one as well. Um, transactional analysis and Jungian psychology. Um, and I feel that this topic of trauma and navigating the boundaries between coaching and therapy, if there are any, which we'll find out in the session, um, is particularly um, uh, interesting. And I'm, I'm really um, hoping to be able to add value from that perspective. Thank, thank you, B. I love the fact that we know we're going to find out in this session. That's really <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> and let's go finally to Pete. Yeah, thanks, Nick. So, yeah, my name is Pete White. I'm a mental health consultant, uh, largely in the workplace. So I work with large organisations, but I also work with the NHS on things like trauma recognition, trauma response, kind of uh, 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 early intervention stuff, certainly with the staff. Um, I've also got a personal connection with trauma as well. So I experienced trauma when I was in the, the military. I've got a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, which I'm still undergoing treatment for these days. Um, so I understand it both from a personal standpoint and also from a professional standpoint. Um, and a lot of the work I do these, these days with the organisations is around trauma and how can they support their, their employees who have maybe experienced it. And yeah, um, a little bit about me, really. Great. Thank you so much, Pete. Let's crack on with the first question then and I think let's define the term trauma let's figure out what do we mean by trauma um so who would like to have a stab at what what is trauma what do we mean by that I suppose I'll jump in um so trauma is in its most basic sense is any kind of highly uh, distressing or upsetting event or events but what's really important to point out from my my, my perspective is that what characterizes those things what what constitutes those things will vary drastically person to person so what one person might find traumatic and you know could lead to, to further uh, issues and, and distress for them another person might experience no issues whatsoever and also vice versa with different events um so yes we have a definition of trauma where is anything highly stressful or, or, or distressing but it's how actually that shows up will vary massively yeah that's, that's how i see it anyway Let's get it. Thanks, Pete. Let's get a few other um, variations or, or, or additions. So, Doc, go for it. 
Yeah, I always uh, keep telling my clients that uh, we always think that trauma is one single event. It really doesn't have to be. Um, it can be, you know, microaggressions piled up like bullying over the years that can be very traumatic um, or, you know, doesn't even if you have a, a great and stable family, you know, that your household is, is um, great, stable, amazing, you can still be traumatized by your peers, for instance. So, yeah, I just wanted to add that it's not mm. just it's not just this one event. Yeah, it can be incremental. Great. Hey, go for it. Um, yes, I agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, but just to add to that as well, for me, it's something about your um, internal resources as well. So it is trauma is very individual to each person. Um, but it's also about your inner resources and your capacity to be able to manage kind of a very sort of out of control event that's felt very frightening or distressing. Um, and that will vary in people as well, often depending on what their own sort of childhood experiences have been and how resilience, emotional resilience has developed through their life. Um, Dot mentioned about the sort of the different types, and there are two types of trauma. So the type one would be the single event type trauma, for example, a car accident. Type two trauma would be something like a complex um, post-traumatic stress disorder. And, um, you know, in, in my line of work, what I see that being would be um, children that have experienced sort of, a, it's the chronic nature of it that happens over and over again. So we'd be talking something like abuse, um, uh, neglect, um, domestic violence, those sorts of situations where you're in them and you can't get out of them. And it's just that chronic nature of them. And also it's very repetitive in nature. So there, there is a difference in types of trauma. I think it's really important to understand that in terms of what we're talking about tonight. Mm, yeah. mm. And I, I wanted to add actually just um, to, to these points that, um, for example, two siblings can grow up in the same family. And um, just to pick up on what Pete and Fiona were saying about being, it being very individual, and there's a very helpful um, three E's model, uh, which talks about the event the experience and the effect. And I think this is really important to think of trauma from these three perspectives, because this explains why people experience or have um, a longer or shorter term effect of trauma. Mm. Yeah, Dot, you put your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, discrimination to the trauma list. Just, you know, to just raise awareness for this. If you're constantly discriminated against, of course, that's going to be traumatizing. Mm. So fantastic. Thank you for, for sharing. I guess. So what I'm hearing, there's there's an element of the input, if you like, of the world, whatever that might be. And then there's the effect that it leaves you with, which we then call trauma. I started off this whole um, session by saying that I've been a coach for 20 odd years and it didn't feature for the first 17 odd years or at least didn't seem to. I'm kind of curious what, yeah, I see you put that face dot and you might be right to do so. It might be my client types. It might be I was totally unaware. I was missing it. It could be many things, but I'm curious. What's your sense as a group of as to why trauma seems to be so much more present within the coaching field right now or indeed in the wider world as well? What are your thoughts on that? I don't mind going first. I, I suppose, um, I think there's more awareness. Mm. Uh, you know, you think of the sort of the impact of social media these days, there's a lot of accounts that talk about trauma, there's a lot more that you see on television, um, you know, in the written media as well. So I think people are talking more about traumatic experiences. Um, but I think as well, you know, we've collectively come out of a two year fairly traumatic period. Um, COVID is not gone, we know that, but, um, you know, the, the impact of things like lockdowns on people's mental health, um, I think has also added to a, a build up and an awareness of, of trauma. Yeah, and I'm definitely noticing this in, in my supervision practice as well. As we're coming out of COVID, the, the amount of um, questions around navigating these boundaries is increasing. And um, there are a lot more reports of clients um, needing um, support, either additional support or more um, trauma-informed or trauma-sensitive support in coaching. 
Yeah, I, I mean, for, for me, I, th- I think Fee and, and, and Umbi have both hit on the head there in terms of a lot of it is, is around awareness, both awareness of the, the people who might be going through it, you know, they're aware of, of what's happened to them and, and how that's impacted them, but also we as coaches and, and as external people are more aware and able to, to spot things that might be going on. Um, and that awareness can often generate more open conversations and people more more willing to say, you know, this happened or I feel like this. Um, and I think that ties into, you know, you might hear somebody say um, years ago, not, nobody really talks about sexuality. Well, OK, yeah, that they might not have done, but also awareness and acceptance of that has increased a lot as well. But it was still a thing back then as well. And I think it's a similar kind of thing when we're talking about trauma. It's, it's, that, it's that awareness and that acceptance. Yeah, uh, I guess it's my turn. <laughs> um, and I agree completely with uh, Fiona. Um, I did a little bit of research uh, to prepare for this, uh, but I uh, completely forgot the name of the one that I wanted to drop. Uh, let's see how, how great, greatly prepared I am. Um, it's the CEO of one of the biggest trauma-focused care centers that has uh, offices in Amsterdam, London, Berlin, and on Malta, weirdly, and it's a it's a very very chic, very very posh, very very bougie institution. And the CEO said, "We are living in a time of global con- uh, collective trauma." Now that is like I I would not I would not do this. I would not say this. Uh, we can discuss it. Um, the cultural anthropologist in me, because yes, I also studied cultural anthropology, um, might say, okay, uh, it looks a little bit more like a global cultural trauma, COVID. And um, yeah, so people are seeking help. People are showing more and more distress um, in coaching sessions as well. And I think it's it's our job to respond to that. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. So having sort of laid the foundations, we've discussed what trauma is and in a sense why it's potentially more present now than it has been, or at least we're noticing it more or we're talking about it more. There has been a a real trend in the last couple of years to talk about trauma-informed coaching. So I want to kind of move the conversation on now to looking at specific movements within the coaching field that are responding to this, the notion of trauma. So what does it mean to be trauma informed within the coaching field? What does that What does that mean as a label? Because I don't think I am. <laughs> so for me, to be trauma informed um, is obviously is is having that awareness of what trauma, what happen, what what can happen as a consequence of trauma, um, of being able to facilitate and hold a conversation just around trauma, not about the trauma. That's a very different thing. Um, and also being aware of things like re I'm going to try and say this the first time re-traumatization um, and how a person may be re-traumatized and what that may look like and uh, things like uh, conditions associated with, associated with trauma like for example PTSD complex PTSD uh, acute stress response etc and um, what what they look like and if um, within a coaching context if a client could be experiencing issues around that, then what can we as a coach do to better support that client? Because I think at some point you need to have your own personal boundaries as a coach as to when to put maybe cut the coaching the coaching to, to one side and focus on what's happened in front of you now from a, you know, somebody might be in, in significant distress, for example, and how we can how we can tackle that. And for me, that's what trauma informed is. It, it, it is multifaceted and there's quite a lot to cover. But it's it's just being being aware, holding conversations, being aware of re re traumatization, and also what trauma and resulting conditions look like. And I just want to add to that. I have my trusty notes right here, so I think it starts with recognizing trauma to begin with, or trauma responses, because they're more than just fight, flight, and freeze. There's also collapse and breakdown. Um, there is um, please and appease, and there's attached cry for help. An attached cry for help, for instance, can show up in a coaching session when the coachee doesn't want to end the session. Just, just as a as an example, um, when the client is um, in an acute trauma response state, they 
and I think this is really important to mention today, they become virtually uncoachable because they are not present in the here and now. And trauma-informed means that you have the tools in order to get the client back into the here and now, at least. And uh, this is why we're doing this. We are technically breaking ICF codes because we are leading when we ask them, hey, where are you right now? Can you feel your body? Stuff like that. But are we leading in order to be open again at the end and to render the client coachable again or not? And I, I really want to discuss this today. That sounds good. We'll get there. Do you want to go or shall I? Shall I go? Go for it. Go for it. Okay. Um, for me, I, I mean, I think I'm going to sort of summarise a bit of what of what Pete and Dot have said so far. But for, for, I think it is about having an understanding of the impact that trauma has on the brain and the development and how it rewires your brain to some extent. Um, before going into my three things, I was just going to say there is a difference, and Pete alluded to this, there is a vast difference between being trauma-informed and doing the trauma work. Um, and I will put it out there right now. I don't think coaching, I know we'll come on to talk about this later, but I don't think as coaches we should be doing trauma work. Um, however, I do think that coaches should be trauma-informed. And I think for me, this sort of, to summarise a little bit of what's been said already, the three things to think about are yes being able to spot the signs of trauma responses which doc has just um, gone into some detail on the second is about how do you create a safe space because when when you are in a trauma response you want to get people back into feeling they've gone into a place of unsafety that's not even a word but you know what i mean they're not in a safe place in that spe in that moment so it is about bringing them back into feeling safe in the room and with you as their coach as well. And we can think about you know, a bit further on about how you, how you do that. And part of that, the third thing, is emotional regulation and helping the coachee be able to regulate and be back in the moment. Um, Dot is absolutely right. They, if you are in that trauma response, you are not coachable, you cannot do any of the work. The, the, the main purpose of your work at that point is to try and bring them back into being emotionally regulated. And if they are able to get into that space, then you might be able to do some more of the coaching session with them. Really interesting. Thank you. Lee, anything you want to add? Okay. So I'd like to pick up on this. This is really, really useful for me because I didn't really know what trauma-informed coaching was. It, I wasn't sure whether it was doing the work on the trauma or simply being aware of it in the room, etc. So this is fascinating. It, and it makes me think about at the start, you, as you shared what trauma is, it seemed like it was quite an endemic experience potentially in many, 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 many people. So if you were going to coach in a niche where trauma was common, you might say, well, I definitely need to be trauma informed. But it sounds like you're saying coaches need to be trauma informed. Yeah, oh, you're nodding enthusiastically. Do you want to say something? <laughs> I just wanted to say yes, but uh, we have a later question alluding uh, to that point, so I don't want to take on too much, but yes. Pete, you were going to say something too, I think. Uh, well, really, I, I, I was just going to agree, but you were saying that you kind of alluded there to how, how common it can, it can be, and absolutely. I mean, if we take PTSD, for example, you know, how commonly associated with trauma, um, if, if we look at the, um, the stats, it's around about 10 to 12 percent of females will experience PTSD and around about five to six percent of males will, will experience it. And if we start uh, applying those those percentages to the wider population, then we start to get a feel for just how common PTSD is. But it's worth pointing out, it doesn't just have to be PTSD. Trauma is mm. much more than PTSD. You know, that's a specific condition. Um, and so there, there is a stat, and please don't quote me, so I, I can't find where I got this from, but it's something like 50% of females will experience some form of trauma in their lifetime um and it, it, it is less than men uh, sorry it, it is less with men i should say um so yeah it is something that is actually potentially much more common than what we realize it is and this is one of the reasons why i think it's so important that as coaches that we we should be trauma informed because there is a high likelihood that 
um, you will be speaking to somebody at some point in your time as a coach who has experienced trauma. It may or may not come up, but if it does come up, you're you're really going to be glad that you've you've, you've done that trauma informed training beforehand, so you're actually equipped and able to recognise it. Pete, uh, and, Pete and Fee, if you want to say anything as well, please do in a second. But I just want to ask Pete something specifically. You are a um, mental health first aid trainer as well. Is mental health first aid the same as trauma informed? And if not, what's the difference? No, it's it's not. Um, so mental health first aid covers elements of trauma, um, and I would argue in the majority of mental health first aid courses, it's relatively thin. The actual content that it covers. Um, so, for example, if we look at the course that I do, we, we don't actually talk about trauma specifically. We talk about PTSD, you know, what that looks like, a little bit about what can cause it. Um, and then if somebody is having an, a PTSD episode, what can we do in that moment to support that person? And then what can we do in the, in the latter moments to help them to, to signpost them and to further support? But to become trauma-informed, is there's a lot more work to do there, um, focusing on the actual subjects of, of trauma. Mm. Um, yeah, so they, they, are, they are different things, very much so. Mm. Fee, be anything? Yeah, I was, just, I was just thinking as well, one of the things I didn't mention was, I don't know whether this is specifically about being trauma-informed, but it, it kind of comes into it, is that coaches need to be able to recognise in themselves what they feel able to manage as well and I think that's really important when you're thinking about whether you are trauma informed it's about being able to say actually this feels out of my depth and be really reflective and honest about that um, and be honest with your, your your clients as well about whether you feel like this is something as I say trauma work is very different to being trauma informed um, but I just wanted to add that we might go on to this later but I just think it's really important for coaches to be able to reflect themselves on how they feel about working, you know, with with a client that might have a trauma history. Mm. Yeah. I, I just want to add to... Sorry, Pete, go on. Thanks, Pete. Um, to what Fiona just said, because I think that's just so important about working to the level of our competency within coaching. And I just want to add to that because sometimes we you know, we might have some knowledge of, around trauma, but that doesn't necessarily give us competency. Um, and because we're not trained therapists, we don't know the, you know, the kind of knowledge and competency that those people uh, require to be able to work with trauma. So um, it's important to recognize in ourselves if we feel that something is beyond, is uh, we feel out of our depth. And also to keep in mind whether the tools that I've learned in coaching um, or the tools that I have available support me to support my client. Yeah. And, and, and just to add to both what Fia, Fia and B said there, which is spot on, is how comfortable do you feel personally, as in uh, aside from your, your, your competence? So if we take myself for an example, I might be speaking to a client, um, but they might say, I'd like to talk about the time I spent in Afghanistan. Now, my trauma happened in Afghanistan. So at that point, I would say, um, okay, I'm really sorry, but I'm not going to be the best person to talk about that because I need to take care of myself as well because there's a high likelihood what they're going to say is going to cause me issues. Um, and it's that personal awareness and um, understanding of your own personal limits and being uh, willing and prepared to say no nicely, but say no if you are not personally comfortable with, with something. Don't go for it. Yeah, just a quick add. Um, I think it hasn't been mentioned in, in, in that specific, uh, specifically uh, already. Um, like triggers for trauma can be literally anything. Anything. Like when you as a coach look a certain way and that can be traumatizing to your client. Um, when you take a note and then just look down like this sometime can be traumatizing to people, not to all of them. And, and, and just like it really differs and it can happen in every single session. It can happen to you uh, that you see your, your client uh, being traumatized again, even if you are quote unquote, just a business coach, especially when you talk with your clients about, you know, failed businesses in the past. Boom. And uh, same goes for you you can get traumatized as well. 
And I just really want to say Fee, uh, Fiona did a great <laughs> job explaining this, like um, the honesty and the transparency that trauma informed and coaches and then of course trauma therapists and trauma workers uh, have to do in order to like really say hey um let's just take a breather together it's just i'm doing this right now for myself in order to calm myself down in order co to coach you again you don't have to do the same breathing exercise or whatever exercise you're doing somatic bodywork exercise i'm doing you don't have to partake in this it's just so that we are back in the present because right now i admit i am not let me play devil's advocate with this a little bit because what i'm hearing is I would be scared to become a coach at this point if I was listening to this conversation. I'd be like, oh, my <laughs> goodness me, this sounds like every human being is a walking trauma <laughs> response and and I'm meant to know how to deal with it. And not only that, but there's mental first aid, which, first aid, which is different, but not only that, there's yada, yada, yada. I think I might go, you know what, I think I quite like the job I've got. <laughs> and, and at the same time, you look around the coaching profession and there isn't um, a, a professional competency called trauma awareness so i'm kind of w wondering a why not based on this conversation and b what it takes to become trauma aware given that you've still got to learn to be a coach too like probably i could spend as many days teaching trauma awareness not me personally but some you know, the school kid and you'd never get around to learning coaching so i'm going to play devil's advocate by just going like how do we deal with that like what's realistic here hmm. i think um this wasn't invented by me, but I don't remember who said it. Um, there are, um, but it's a really helpful classification of levels of working with trauma. So the first level would be if trauma shows up, you signpost the individual to a different kind of support, such as therapy. The second level is trauma sensitivity, um, which is actually trauma informed. But I actually like the word sensitivity because it implies. Uh, behavior and a connection rather than a, a knowledge. When you think trauma-informed, you think, oh, I need to be an expert on trauma. Um, and I think trauma sensitivity takes care of that. And then the third level is actually working on the trauma. And I think within the coaching space, um, we, don't, we don't actually need to be trauma-informed. We need to have at least some basic knowledge to be able to signpost the individual and it also really helps to be trauma-informed and to be able to navigate those moments um, sensitively with uh, our clients to avoid re-traumatization, like uh, Dot was saying. Um, yeah, I'll pause here. Mm. I, love, I love your tripart models you have at your disposal, B. It's always <laughs> got a three-piece model. <laughs> I, I think it's it's important to point out that I mean you're you're talking to four people here who are you know very aware of trauma, very passionate about it, and and deal with it on on a regular basis. So there's probably that element of I don't know if you'd call it a bit of bias or something potentially in in kind of how we're talking. But um, it's important to point out that it's it's a massive spectrum. You know, you could watch a ten minute video on trauma to and, and just to learn a bit. Or you could study for seven years and become a psychotherapist. Then you've got everything in between of that. So if you're watching this and going, oh, my God, this sounds quite scary and stuff. Well, yeah, absolutely. It can sound scary. Trauma is not a nice thing in itself. Um, but please don't let it put it off you because coaching is so much more than just trauma. There's, you know, Coaching as a whole is some of the best conversations you can have with people and trauma might not show up. But it's just giving yourself that tool. And the way I describe this is... If you were to do a, a, a physical first aid course, you, you will learn how to do CPR. Now, that is a scary prospect of having to do, and I really hope you never have to do it. But if it comes up, you're going to be glad that you, you've done that training. And for me, it's, it's the same kind of thing. It's just giving yourself those skills for if and when they do come up. But it's absolutely not something to, to put people off co coaching because mm. coaching is phenomenal. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and also to add just a brief thing, the other thing which I think is useful is how we contract and prepare to start working with a client in a way that we um, don't put ourselves, the client and the space at risk of entering um, a type of work that isn't suitable. 
role for coaching. So I, I hope we'll cover that as well. Yeah, I just saw your hand go up, I think. Yeah, I was um, just about to say what more or less that Beatrice put it much more um, articulately than me. But yes, around that sort of the boundaries of how you, you set out. And I think there is something as well about the, the type of coaching that you want to offer and the type of coaches to who you want to be. Um, I was quite surprised when I talked to sort of some of my cohort that I was training with um, on the Animas training. And when I look back at my practice clients, um, I think all bar one brought some sort of emotional issue. Now, not all of them had a, a, a big trauma history. There was one or two that did. But I suspect that's probably because of my training and my background and, you know, my experience in, in professionally speaking, it kind of found me as well. And then I find it and I can see it. Whereas I suspect for people that are maybe not working with emotional issues all of the time, they may not see it in the same way, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? I'm hoping so. Um, so it depends kind of like what type of coaching you're doing and what sort of a coach you want to show up as as well. I can't ignore it because it's what I've been doing for years and years yeah. and years. Um, but I think for a lot of people that are coming in from very different backgrounds to themselves, it probably doesn't show up quite as frequently. I, would say. Yeah. I hope that's reassuring in <laughs> some respects. Yeah, thank you, Fee. Well, I think, I mean, I guess the question for me is around this idea that trauma could be everywhere and anywhere. And so no matter how much you contract for it, it might be under the surface anyway. But I, but I totally get your point, and I, and I, and I, I appreciate that. I'm gonna, if it's okay, I'm gonna throw in a question that's come in from a viewer, which is, you know, so it's out of kilter with my plan. But I think it'd be great to, since we're live and since we've got a question, I think let's do it. So I'm gonna bring it up on the screen. Um, do you categorize adverse childhood experiences and the potentially resulting developmental immaturity as trauma? And if so, how do you respond to this in your coaching, given it is often more subtle? So deep. Interesting question. I'm curious if you've got a, a take on that, anyone? Dot looks like she's rubbing her hands in. Like, oh, yeah. It. <laughs> this is, uh, I see this every, well, not every day, but a lot in my practice. Um, and uh, it's actually something that we know when we go through Animas training, uh, transaction, <laughs> transactional, um, oh, sorry, German, um, transactional analysis. analysis. Um, thank you so much. Um, it's that, you know, when we see our client all of a sudden uh, reverting kind of back into this into this uh, child state and um, all of a sudden um, taking on drama triangle, uh, the um, the position of uh, the victim mm -hmm. um, and a lot. And um, yeah, so I would say that adverse childhood um, experiences are not a guarantee for trauma. They are not. Because, you know, some people are more resilient than others, naturally. Some people have more access to resources uh, that, you know, allow them to navigate their life better. Um, but, yeah, you can definitely see it uh, in the coaching session. And uh, in a way, we are already trained forward we just have to kind of sharpen our antennas yeah thank you anyone else well, actually fee you, you've worked a lot with children is that something whilst this question is more about adults who perhaps haven't developed fully is there something you want to add to this yeah i mean what, what i would suggest to anybody watching is well there is one person watching obviously because they sent in the question um that you could look up things around adverse childhood experiences so that shortened to aces um there's been a lot of research done mainly in america um around certain um, childhood experiences such as you were in a household where there was domestic violence or there was um parental mental ill health um a parent in prison incarcerated um, please don't ask me to name all of them, <laughs> but um, there is, you can look that sort of stuff up. There has been some criticism of ACEs, but I think generally it is seen as a good indicator that there may, and I really stress that word, may be an indication of a trauma history. Mm -hmm. um, basically, the more ACEs you have, I think there's seven in total, the more ACEs you have, 
there's um they did it as a sort of a physical health study as well as a mental health study but over the years it was a, a longitudinal study that it showed that actually adults who have experienced i think it was four or more child, adverse childhood experiences were something like and I'm not quoting correctly here, so you would need to look it up, but were, you know, sort of maybe three times more likely to have heart failure, four times more likely to get cancer, that sort of thing. As I say, the statistics are wrong, but um, certainly that having those adverse childhood experiences actually affected your physical health as well as your mental health. So that's what they are. Um, I guess it could be useful when you're doing that initial sort of um you know, those sort of initial assessment sessions that sort of getting to know each other to sort of think in your mind. I, I wouldn't suggest that you would go through them. I don't think that's for a coach to go through them, but that you might use them and just sort of as, as pointers, guides to kind of ask some sort of questions around that if you feel that that's the area that it's going into. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and adverse um, childhood experiences. So one adverse childhood experience on its own isn't necessarily an indicator of trauma, but... Um, there was, um, I mean, Gabor Mate does lots of um, uh, talks on the topic, and he was saying that um, if they're uh, in his work with addicts and people in the prison system, um, most of them had, I think it was something like four plus. Uh, adverse childhood experiences so there was an indication that uh, when there are several of these uh, aces in place uh, that there can be an indication of trauma uh, but I wanted to address the the end of the question um, how do you respond to this in coaching given that it's often more subtle so there is the work that we can do in the in the initial the discovery stage contracting with the client explaining what coaching is, uh, getting clear on the objectives of the coaching. Um, but also I think it's important to think of coaching as a not just a one-off contracting in the beginning, but as a constant micro-contracting conversation um, and noticing when things do come up, addressing them in the space and not um, leaving them. So if we notice something that feels subtle, how can we bring that in the space, you know, and I, I, to Dot's point, you know, is this leading? I don't think it's leading as long as it's in um, the highest support of um, the client. Yeah, thank you, B. And um, we've got another question from somebody, but I'm just, if, you, if you're still watching, I'll, I will come to your question about the loss of parents, but I'm going to kind of move into the next phase of our exploration. And I'll bring that question a bit later. Actually, I will actually read it out now so you guys get a bit of time to think about it in case you're like, ooh. Uh. Mm -hmm. So the question is, but don't answer it yet, uh, how to help someone having trauma after losing one or both parents? So just you can just begin to play with it in your mind. But let's move on to the next phase, which is we've kind of established that it sounds like it's useful, certainly, for coaches to have awareness of trauma, potentially to be trained to some degree in trauma. What does that take? So imagine me. I, I run a coaching school. What does it take for me to train somebody to a level of trauma awareness that's sufficient to handle what you're talking about is the endemic challenge of trauma? What, what is, is that a 10-minute conversation? Is it a one-day special? Is it a is it a 10-month program? Like, what does it take to get somebody trauma-informed? Give me some notion of that. So this is quite a difficult one to answer because it's what are the standards that we're working against? And, uh, in, you know, in, in, and is it regulated, which... No, it isn't. Um, so it's quite a difficult one. I mean, I, I, I'm really hesitant to say this. I don't want to come across like I'm trying to plug. Um, I'm currently creating a, a trauma-informed e-learning course, which is around about an hour and a half. Now, what I've covered in that, I, um, if somebody were to go through that and you know, take the time and pay attention, do what's in there, I believe that um, after that, they, they would be uh, sufficiently trauma-informed to, uh, hopefully, to go and, and then to work with clients who potentially may have experienced trauma and so would feel more comfortable to work in that space. However, um, someone might not feel comfortable with that and they might want to take a two-day or a four-day course. So you might have somebody who wants to go to the extent of doing some kind of a certificate or even a diploma in trauma. And it, it's a very individual thing. And it's it's individual both in, in the sense of the actual individual person, but also... Um, what what standard are we looking to achieve here? Um, and I think that is something that hopefully people will get out of this conversation because there is no single right answer for that. 
you know, it's, there's so many different variations of it. But yeah, so for me, it, it, generally speaking, an hour and a half, but that's a very, very rough thing. To yeah, yeah. Dot, what do you think? Um, I think we should also keep in mind uh, in which field of coaching we are working. You know, if someone is a relationship coach, they might want to look deeper into this. If someone is, uh, I don't know, a finance coach, they might just want to look a little bit into this. Um, it really depends on the area you're working with and also depends on which kind of skills you want to pick up. For instance, if you want to pick up embodiment, you know, then... And if you think you can integrate this into your coaching practice, then go for it. The more, the better, of course, um, always. But um, yeah, I think the the main thing is to be able to pick it up, like the, when trauma shows up, and to be able to do a dissociation disruptor technique just in order to get the client back into the here and now. And of course, watch your own mental health. You need to learn that as well. Um, but yeah, I think that's like the the basic, basic, basic stuff that I I truly think that everyone should know this. Hmm. And I, I wanted to add that I think having a sort of a trauma-informed training really helps just to build that foundation so that you go into any coaching conversation with some confidence that okay if something comes up I have some some language I have some mm -hmm. tools I am able to recognize when it appears and also keeping in mind going back to what we were saying earlier about each individual being very different, each trauma and how they're relating to their trauma can be very different. And every coach is very different and their level of competency and um, uh, ability to navigate that can be very different. So I think that also having an, obviously I'd say this because I'm a supervisor, but I think that having an um, ongoing space where you can reflect on your practice and get support with the particular case that you're facing rather than trying to apply this, oh, there's this rule or, you know, and just apply that to all the cases that um, we have. Yeah, makes sense. Fee, anything else to add? Um, I think Pete's right that it's individual. I think the only other thing I would add to how much needs to be done is how long is a piece of string and how quickly people sort of understand stuff. My experience of doing trauma-informed training with foster carers, with you know, social workers' schools, I go in and, you know, foster carers, we do a whole day and, you know, um, schools, we do maybe an hour, a couple of hours. There's a difference between knowing it and then being able to embed it in your practice. So I think my point would be keep revisiting it. If it's something that interests you, if it's something that keeps showing up with the clients that you have, go back and do not necessarily exactly the same course or training a workshop but go and do something different Let's keep teaching the same methods because I know even for myself it you know it took me a while to sort of really sort of start to embed this stuff and really properly use it in my practice um, so yeah I think just the idea of revisiting is something I'd like to add yeah I can really imagine that's the case I it, it, certainly I, I can picture somebody doing a one-hour workshop and thinking they know something and then boof it's gone when when it's really needed you know the moment that something happens in the in the coaching space and it's like, what was that course I did again three years ago? Like, you know, I can definitely imagine that being a, a, a significant challenge. So um, so I, one of the questions was uh, that we, we talked about in advance was, should all coaches therefore receive trauma training? Should Is that something you think should be? I think I can see Dot doesn't think it should be. So obviously not. <laughs> no, no, never. <laughs> Go never. On, what, what trauma schmama. <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on this? Mine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, like I said, um, I think that every coach should receive a sort of SOS toolkit. And it doesn't need to be a lot. Like Pete just pointed out, like one and a half hours is certainly, you know, it's, I think everyone can cram that in into their bu busy uh, schedule just to sharpen the awareness for trauma and just, you know, know that there are more than just three trauma responses that that in and of itself can already do so much good. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, like I said, dissociation disruptors, like, you know, grounding techniques, no, uh, at least, at least five different grounding techniques uh, that might, you know, be a good, good catalog for you. 
Um, and um, same, I cannot agree enough with Beatrice and Fiona. Intervision and supervision are paramount when you're doing, uh, you know, trauma-informed coaching. It's it's just it's so important for your own mental health as well. Remind me, intervision is that is that peer supervision? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> that's intervision. Yeah, yeah, great, thank you. I mean, I have to say, an hour and a half doesn't seem undoable by most schools including animas however the vast majority of coaches haven't received this yet so if you're a coach that hasn't yet received this but you're already qualified this is uh, to all of you where how would you begin to become trauma-informed are there courses would you read a book like what's your what would be your first step so I've got to be a little bit careful here because that's this is literally what I do. Day to day is uh, provide training in this kind of type of stuff. So I'll try not to promote myself. But um, I, th I think the, the easiest and most basic step is to go on somewhere like uh, the Mind website, mind.org.uk, go to the search bar and type in trauma, right, and just see what comes up and have a read through the articles and what they and, and what is there because what those guys produce on their website is so accessible so easy to understand um pretty pretty comprehensive without making it clinical uh, so you know we don't want to confuse masses here and unnecessarily and um, just as a basic step and then build out from there if you feel like you want to so if you know that um that content might talk about um for example dot has mentioned disassociation a couple of times which is a, a fairly common uh, symptom of uh of, of ptsd and complex ptsd um where and so they might go, okay, let's have a look at disassociation. What is that? Um, how can I help somebody who might be uh, having an episode and they're uh, they are just disassociating? There we go. Um, so build out that way. Um, I think certainly it would be good to do some kind of mental health first aid uh, course where that will give you the tools to support somebody if they are experiencing issues in in the session and. Um, then you can have a think then on where you can draw the boundaries between coaching and, and not coaching, you know, supporting someone in, in distress. Um, but yeah, just, just, just as a basic, just jump on the internet, have a Google on a reliable site, and um, then kind of go from there as much as you feel like you want to. And yes, I do that stuff if you want to chat with me about it. <laughs> Doc, go for it. Yeah, this is how I became trauma informed. Uh, I looked at trauma, uh, trauma training for coaches or trauma course coaches, um, and I found a U.S. source, which is the NIKBM, the National Institute for the Clinical Application of Behavioral Medicine, and they have courses that are um, held by the worst, world's leading ex, uh, experts on trauma. For instance, Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote the book, The Body Keeps the Score, which is a trauma must read, uh, I think. Um, and um, when I like Googled that, I was just like, okay, yeah, I gonna take some courses there. And um, it's weird, like, <laughs> I think when you, when you care about this sort of work, it finds you. You get kind of sucked in into this whirlwind of, of okay, I really want to know more about trauma. And you keep on reading, like, for instance, one book that I just recently discovered uh, while signing up for a trauma conference, which is also a good way to start uh, becoming trauma informed. There are a lot of free conferences, online conferences out there on trauma like really great stuff. And you can uh, you can pick up a lot of skills there. you can. Um, see you know the experts you can you can get a more feeling for this and the book i don't want to <laughs> i don't want to keep it from you is um it's called the angel and the assassin and it's written by donna jackson nakazawa and it's a uh, very recent findings in neurobiology on how the brain changes due to trauma and i was just like Pff. so when you're a nerd like me because i think to do this work, you have to be fairly nerdy. You really have to be just like, yeah, but how is this working? And um, you, you just, you will have the time of your life. So it will not be so stressful just because you will, you will learn all these new things, all these new skills, all these new books. 
uh, learn about microglia cells, for instance. And um, yeah, so trauma in and of itself is an ugly thing. Like Pete said, I wholeheartedly agree. But learning about trauma can be quite exciting. I feel like B, you want to come in, do you or not? Oh, okay, B? No, I haven't really got much to add apart from the, um, the NIC ABM. They've also got a really nice Instagram page, which they put a lot of their stuff on and might do sort of like two or three minute clips um, with trauma experts. Um, so you can sort of pick up a little bit from that. Um, I mean, my, my resources I would normally send people to tend to be for the more sort of severely traumatised, so we're talking complex PTSD, which, um, you know, the children that have been in care, um, adults that obviously then come out. Um, but if anybody was interested, um, Beacon House um, have an amazing website. As I say, it is quite specific to, to that sort of field. Um, but they have some lovely little animations which, which talk about um, window of tolerance, um, which is, you know, when you're in your window, you're working at your optimum level and you're at your very best. But what we know is for people who have experienced trauma, their window tends to be much narrower. And as a result, they're sort of going into these fight, flight, freeze, or the um, survival responses that Doc was referring to earlier. Um, but they've got two very nice little um, animations on window of tolerance and also um, on developmental trauma, which is mm. used to the children that have experienced ACEs that then become adults. So that might be, I'm not saying that will be of use to everybody and certainly not for every coach, but if anybody is very interested in that particular field or is doing some relationship coaching, that sort of thing, it would be really helpful for them to take a look at that. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's really helpful. Um, thank you, Fiona, for talking about the window of tolerance and also coming back to working within our level of competency. Um, am I in my window of tolerance? Am I able, while I'm working with this client, to stay um, self-regulated and able to contain and hold space for the individual? Or am I feeling that I'm, you know, triggered perhaps or uncomfortable or getting anxious so that's also um, important and it, it sounds really obvious but very often I think as coaches because we're so focused on the other person and we're meant to be present with the other person and you know park anything that's going on for us I think it's really important to put ourselves uh, in the equation uh, when we're coaching especially when trauma shows up. Thanks, B. I'm going to pull on, uh, pull out a couple of questions here from the uh, from the social world. So I, I told you one earlier. I'm going to bring this one up on the screen. How to help someone having trauma after losing one or both parents? So I realised the one. Then what I'm going to bring up are a couple of examples, if you like, and you might not have great answers to them, or you might have amazing answers to them. But I'm just going to offer it and see what comes up. So, what are your thoughts on this? How to help someone having trauma after losing one or both parents? From a supervision perspective, um, and you know, first I, I can't even imagine what that must be like for the for the person suffering such a such a trauma. And I think it's really important how how we nav navigate that. And perhaps you know, I'd love Fiona and the others to contribute to um, the the kind of language we might use in a session when, when something like this shows up. Um, from a supervision perspective, I don't feel that coaching is the right tool to support an individual who's um, recently suffered such a, such a significant trauma. I can add more there, but I'm, I'm sure others have something to add as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I think in, in, in that um, example, I think it would be best to maybe just allow the person just to speak, to share whatever they want to share, just to, all you're doing in that time is you're holding that space, allow them to say whatever they want to say. Um, um, allow, and what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Just communicate the fact that however they feel is okay, though it's totally normal. Um, and then maybe to, to look onto, are there other resources, are there other organisations that they feel would be helpful? For example, you've got Cruise, the uh, bereavement charity, uh, you know, what, how would they feel about contacting them? People um, quite regularly visit their GP uh, following a, a bereavement because the, yeah. the GP has resources that can help with that. Um, so when it comes to coaching, 
the only element of coaching I would say to bring into that would be hold the space, listen, and and you know, un, un, uh, 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 compassion, empathy, understanding, and then we're looking to you know signpost on it and support them in that way. But to try and support them in any other way could potentially take us in a direction that we really don't want to be going in. Thanks, Pete. I agree. Go for it, yeah, same, same. I agree. Uh, and just, uh, I think, uh, just tell them that all their feelings are valid. Like they're allowed to feel all the feels. And uh, I just wanted to add that grief counselors exist for a reason. So, you know, um, and it's a very specific skill set. So, so let me just say this. Uh, we, we, I mean, obviously, whoever posted that, we don't know what their intention was behind the question, whether they wanted to work with the trauma or it's more that's come up in the coaching or whatever. We don't know. So whoever wrote that, please don't assume that we know what's right for you in any shape or form or even what you meant. But going on that question, I'm kind of, thinking about what B said at the very start, which is I wouldn't work with that in coaching. So then I'm thinking, oh, is there this risk that we begin, that in the coaching field, we begin to think, ah, I'm coaching formed. I can do that kind of work. This is appropriate for coaching. What are your thoughts on, and my original question to you was going to be around the boundary between coaching and therapy, but it feels less relevant. The therapy almost feels like a red herring here. It's more about competency. What is What is your competency? So what are your thoughts on, the, what I would call the creeping nature of trauma into coaching as a thing to be worked on in coaching and any sort of thoughts or opinions? I was given some thought to this um, when you first posted the question and for me it feels like it's a, it's a spectrum you know with maybe a sort of psychoanalysis psychotherapy down this end and a coaching more at this end and I guess you know for me, it still comes back to self-reflection and working out as a coach where you are on that spectrum, because we will all bring in different sets of skills, you know, our personalities, our temperaments, um, you know, what's gone on in our own lives that allows us to, you know, I've had certain situations in my life that, you know, like Pete's uh, alluded to earlier, that you might find that actually this feels like it's not something that I want to go into and actually I want to stay more at the, the coaching end or actually I might even want to sort of pass this on um, to a therapist. I I feel like I've been trying to figure this out ever since I've been doing my coaching training and then I got my um, certificate. Where do I sit on that? Because I've got this therapy background as well and, you know, it, it, it is a movable thing. It's not a sort of set in stone. I think with more experienced people might feel ready to sort of do a little bit more of the sort of not therapy, but might want to delve a little deeper or show a bit more curiosity about things that maybe when they first start coaching, they don't feel ready to. But it for me, it always comes back down to self-reflection and supervision like these. Absolutely spot on. I totally agree with you on that. Use your supervision. Use your supervisors. They, I, I think for me, that's the bit that, is missing a little bit in coaching um i know that's a, a, an organization and must really really encourage it but i know that i've worked with coaches that don't get supervision now they're qualified they don't get supervision and i i, I just don't get that i think supervision is so valuable so yes all you coaches out there go and get some supervision <laughs> Before anyone else jumps in on that question, I just want to pick up something, Fee, from what you said. Um, as a therapist and a coach, in a way, you have the, let's call it, the, the moral authority to do both kinds of work. And it sounds like the contract is pretty important. When you're, if, if something comes up during a coaching contract, let's say, and it feels like therapy is more appropriate, would you aim to recontract or would you say, well, I'm not the right person because I've been your coach? Like, how would, how would it work in your mind? Um, so for me, it's about transparency. And, um, you know, I will be transparent from the start that I'm not just a coach. I'm also a therapist as well. Then it's around the sort of the contracting and the, the boundaries around the work that I'm doing. If it's if it is sort of coaching material that I'm working with and then it starts, as I say, I feel like I have a natural inclination to dig a bit deeper. Um, but I know certainly with, with some clients, um, I've felt the kind of the resistance to that so I've had to sort of check in with myself and go okay what's my agenda here mm -hmm. is this something and then having a conversation about this seems to be going into a different direction it feels like we're moving away a little bit from from coaching is this something that you feel comfortable with or is it something that you feel you want to move on you know back do we need to move um 
I sort of see it like under the sea and that we need to go a little bit nearer the surface um, and, and do that. But I think it's always that um, collaboration with the client about what they feel comfortable with. Yes, check in with myself about what I feel comfortable with. And if I didn't feel comfortable or it was pushing some buttons for me, absolutely having that conversation about I'm not the right person, but I know somebody that would be able to support you with this. Um, but if I feel comfortable, then it's about what they feel comfortable with. Yeah, okay, thank you. I, I, I think, Fee, kind of going back to your question earlier on, Nick, um, about, you know, is, is there a risk where people could go on to attempt to coach, you know, mental health issues and trauma, for example? And, and what Fee said there kind of ties nicely into that, where is there a risk? Yeah, absolutely, there is a risk. It does happen. Um, I have seen multiple mental health coaches with actually very little or no um, kind of credentials or experience to really position themselves in that place. And um, I'm going to go back to the comfort thing in a second. And for me, that's a potentially incredibly dangerous thing to do because when we're talking about the world of uh, mental health and, and, by extension, mental illness, is things can get quite serious quite quickly. I don't want to scare people here, but I'm not going to lie to you either. Um, and if we're going to talk about somebody who is, you know, a coach who deals with mental health, can that be done? Yes, of course it can be done. Everything's possible. But I personally, and this is my own personal standards here, will be looking towards somebody like Fee and her experience as a, in terms of a person who will be at a level to, to do that in a safe manner. That's the biggest thing here is, is to do it safely. To move on to the comfort thing is... What um, what's the client comfortable with? What are you comfortable with? So if during the session you feel like um, what you're talking about is actually attempting to address the original issue, then I would strongly suggest that we take a step back from that. Um, if the client stays then uncomfortable, if you feel you're uncomfortable um, or you start to feel out your depth in any sense, then absolutely take a step back. And there is zero shame in doing that because it's so much better to do that and just be honest with the clients, uh, if that's the case, than to, than to try and save face, crack on and potentially open up a can of worms that you really don't want to be opening. Thanks, Pete. If, unless anyone else has anything to say, I'm going to bring in a few more comments because, um, uh, in fact, yeah, once... I go, actually go, have go, something go. to add. <laughs> yeah, um, it's like... Being a trauma-informed coach is kind of bridging that gap between traditional coaching and psychotherapy, right? And you can it's sometimes also our job to um, hold the space for the client so long as, to, as for the therapist to take over. And what we can do um, until, I'm not sure how it is in the UK, but in Germany, it's really difficult to find uh, a therapist um, that the um, health insurance pays for. It can take up, take up to two years in order for someone to get, you know, the right kind of care. And the question is what to do in the meantime. And one thing that we can do as coaches is to coach our clients on self-care. That we can absolutely do. Like what you, what do you do in order to, you know, feel better, what is it that that makes you feel good? What, where do you feel it in your body? Stuff like that, and um, I think that um, yeah, this is this is our role. <laughs> Interesting. Can I pick you up on something which I, which maybe just needs to be cl clarified, or it might question some of the stuff we've talked about so far. You said that being a trauma informed coach was a bridge between the traditional coach and a psychotherapist, in the sense that what well, we hold the space long enough to bring them back or you mean that there's almost a different kind of coach um i wouldn't i wouldn't yeah i mean we can we can talk about it it's i personally wouldn't say you're an entirely different coach mm. but you are in fact more than a coach but you are definitely not a therapist mm. so you are something in between and it also depends on the training you get on being trauma informed, yeah, yeah. you know, not an hour and a half. <laughs> it depends. It depends. I mean, if it's if it's enough for you, like if if you say an hour and a half is exactly what I need, I just want to be prepared, you know, <laughs> then that's great. But yeah. if you work in a field where 
you know, that is a little bit more prevalent, like relationship coach or like, you know, working as a health coach, especially mm. with people who just quit dieting and mm. uh, or people who are uh, marginalized because of their weight um, that, uh, you know, Nick and I, we had this great talk uh, about that topic. Mm. Um, then you might need a little bit more training, uh, but that still doesn't make you a therapist. So yeah. when uh, in doubt, refer out. That was one thing that I picked yeah. up in <laughs> in training. Yeah. Um, but the trauma-informed quality empowers you to hold the space just a little longer. And then that can be everything to the client. And the client can be super scared in in that situation. And then when you hold the space for them, when you're trauma-informed, uh, then you can also inform the client on what happens in, in therapy and they can make an informed choice on what to do next. And also, mm -hmm. you can coach someone who is in therapy at the same time. It doesn't need to be mutually exclusive. Yeah. Thanks so much, Dot. I'm going to bring in a, a nice little comment here because I know we all felt a little bit nervous before we started. <laughs> Thinking would this work? Could it be any good? And so this is really nice. Finding this valuable. Thank you so much to the trauma knights of the Animal Sign Table. <laughs> I think that makes me the um, wingless worm dragon because I don't know about trauma. So, um, but thank you so much for the knights of this round table. <laughs> oh, oh, and anyway, let's go to uh, Annabelle. We have uh, one with a name, which which is nice. And it's um, I've seen certain coaching niches where coaches specialize in helping women that have gone through domestic abuse, and also another coach helps people with PTSD. Is this okay as a niche? What a great question. Is that okay as a niche? Hmm. I'm holding that <laughs> It's so hard to answer because we don't we don't know what that person's personal experience. I wouldn't want to cast a judgment on somebody because they've decided to do that. Um, I keep coming back to this, but it's the self-reflection. I think, you know, just because you've gone through something doesn't mean that that makes you the person that should be able to do that type of coaching it gives you one aspect of it it gives you a um a certain lens with which to look through um but i think you probably need other things as as, as well but i i don't know about anybody else but i don't feel like i could comment fairly on whether that's um that's okay or not the, the, the only thing when i just encourage that self-reflection is what i'm saying yeah the, um, and I, I agree completely with Fee. The only thing I would add, and this is kind of branching out slightly, is there is something called post-traumatic growth, which is uh, where somebody has experienced trauma and they, they effectively this trauma can fuel a, a, a huge spurt of growth. And it happened to me and it was amazing. Um, and what I've said to people before who have asked me about this is um, I don't see personally much issue with coaching somebody around that period of post-traumatic growth if they are at that point in their journey. Um, you know, and I, 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 I still have PTSD, but, uh, you know, I live very happy, very healthy, 90, 95% of the time. Um, and, you know, I could happily work with a coach around my, my growth off that, but I wouldn't work with a coach on my trauma or my trauma symptoms. Mm. Um, and for me, that's when that would absolutely be fine. But yeah, I absolutely couldn't comment because that person... Uh, who is, is a coach could be a mental health nurse specializing in trauma. And I'd be like, mate, crack on. You're, 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 the, you're the right person. Or there could be somebody who's done my hour and a half trauma informed course and absolutely no. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, it's it, it's a big old spectrum. I can't really answer it. Mm. And ultimately, just to briefly add, um, coaching, therapy, counseling, they're not regulated industries in the UK. So to the question, is it okay as a niche? You know, what is okay from what perspective? You know, you're absolutely legally allowed to call yourself a PTSD coach. Uh, but if you were to submit a recording to the ICF, for example, to be credentialed as a, a coach, um, you probably wouldn't pass that recording when you're coaching uh, uh, on trauma. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Pete, going back to your thing about post-traumatic growth. Yeah. One of the things that strikes me is that the risk that somebody who's trauma-informed might think, great, this person's prime for post-traumatic growth and almost guilt you into 
the lack of growth that maybe somebody's going through at that point of trauma. Like, but, but this is an opportunity to grow. Can't you see that? And, I, and I'm kind of curious by the, I mean, I don't want to go too much of this because of a couple more comments I want to bring up, but I'm kind of curious on your take on that. Uh, so post, post-traumatic growth is, um, it's kind of a organic thing I find. And I mean, I, I can only really speak from my experiences. Obviously I know a little bit in terms of what I do, but it doesn't come up that often is it's something that's fairly organic and it comes towards the latter part of someone's journey after they've mm. been through that, you know, therapeutic treatment. Um, and they're, they're at a point where their, their trauma and their potential, potentially their condition isn't really causing them any, any issues or many issues these days. Um, but it would be the, the, the client who may not know about post-traumatic growth, but they would typically initiate a conversation like that where they'd say, you know, I'm at a point in my life where I really want to get out there and try new things and get to know people. And that is what the coach is working with, um, not necessarily labelling as post-traumatic growth because I don't expect people to be able to recognise post-traumatic growth when the entire world of psychology barely understands it in itself. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it, they're working with the client and how they're presenting, not the concept of PTG. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Dot? Yeah, I, I need to stress one thing. I, I make it quick. Um, when I go on social social media and I see a lot of posts uh, from trauma coaches on trauma PTSD, and Pete, by the way, high five or low five, however it is you want you, you want to do it, I have CPTSD, so now I'm going to out myself. And um, <laughs> I still can have CPTSD and become a trauma coach. They are not mutually exclusive. Um, no, what I see is a lot of, yeah, trauma. Um, tra like working through your trauma kind of gives you wings and you are stronger than before. You are whatever. And there's one thing that I keep saying because this, this really rubs me the wrong way. And what I keep telling people is that trauma does not make you into a better person. It doesn't. And uh, yeah, post-traumatic growth exists for sure. But everything that Pete says, I absolutely, yeah, he's spot on on this. Yeah, thank you, Doc. Let me bring up another comment. I like bringing up these comments. It's great because it means that mm. people are watching us. And it's funny because the screen shows zero watchers, but clearly the, the screen isn't <laughs> measuring very accurately. Uh, let's, I can't read it on my screen. It's too small. If someone says that they have experienced trauma, is this the same as actually experiencing trauma? Hold on a sec. If someone says they've experienced trauma, is this the same as actually experiencing trauma? I don't mean to be disrespectful to anyone mentioning trauma, but how do we assess what needs to be signposted? Do we immediately signpost if someone mentions it, or do we ask more questions to find out more? Does that constitute working with trauma? Interesting, interesting set of questions. I'm really interested in this because being a... Um systemic family therapy person um, we did quite a lot on the use of language and um, the assumptions that we make that when we use certain words they mean the same things to, the same, to each person mm. uh, and I think that question beautifully demonstrates um, that what trauma means to one person doesn't mean the same to another person so I would really advocate um, showing curiosity um, that isn't working with trauma. Showing curiosity is not working with trauma. It's a gathering of information. It's allowing your client to feel held in the space to, yeah, to be able to sort of um, verbalise what has happened to them. Telling you what has, a client telling you what has happened to them is not working with trauma. I don't think. Um, as I say, I think curiosity is is the name of the game. And then when you have more information, you can make a decision about okay, this might be something that needs to be signposted. Yeah. I, and I, really, I really like that Fiona picked up on this key thing around, do we mean the same thing? Because there was just a post just yesterday, we were talking um, um, about anxiety when a client says anxiety and anxiety can mean lots of different things now, not just a clinical diagnosis. So I think it's really important to understand what the client means by trauma without going into... Um, you know, we get, without going into the details. But I think there are some practical things that we can do. And I'm really glad that Julie asked that question. Um, checking with the client the impact that the trauma has on them in the present moment. Yeah. Because I may have had trauma, but I am now um, 
I'm now able to be present and to focus on my coaching objectives, even though that is still part of my life as well. Um, the other question I would have is to what extent does, <laughs> I see a cat uh, tail, <laughs> to what extent does the trauma impact the coaching goals? So for example, um, if we have someone who is clinically depressed and they come to coaching and they say, I would like to feel happy and I would like some strategies to feel happy, um, then it would be it would be quite difficult to do that because the support they might need for their depression might be a different kind of support rather than coaching. So then coaching wouldn't be an effective intervention. Um, so checking what is this overlap between what they're bringing to coaching? Is there enough separation? You know, do they perhaps suffer with depression, but they're getting support in therapy and perhaps they're taking medication and in coaching, they're bringing a clear goal of I'm changing jobs or and I need support to navigate that. Um, and finally, well, I'm, I'm sure there are more questions we could ask, but where the client is on their journey with their trauma, have they had support in the past? Are they now able to access enough resources within themselves to focus on their coaching objectives? Or are they um, still in a space of activation, very traumatized, and they're not able to access their resources? So I think these would be some, uh, <laughs> some sorry, I'm, I'm laughing at Dot's cat. Um, but some good questions to start to explore that in a sensitive way with the client. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'd agree. And I, I, I'm a little bit hesitant to, to just reflect straight back what, what B said here because she worded it perfectly. But I think you know, to answer the question directly, if somebody mentions trauma, do we just sign for straight away? No, not absolutely not necessarily. Um, like Fee said, you know, you can be curious here. You can say, you know, did you want to talk about what 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 you mean by that? Because Something we can um, sometimes do, I'm not saying this is what the, the person who asked the question has done, is we can we can jump to assumptions or, or make or make judgments. And sometimes people might say, well, that, that isn't trauma. You know, that um, that doesn't constitute trauma. And that's a very risky thing to do. For example, I know somebody who one of their triggers for their, their PTSD is a certain brand of ice cream. And if we were to hear that, you'd think that's really odd. But mm -hmm. in the trauma world, and certainly if you listen to their story, that would make perfect sense. Um so it's, it's not jumping up to those those assumptions, uh, being curious, asking questions, but also two of the really important questions for me are, um, or three questions, I should say, is do you feel like this is having a, a really negative impact in your life? Um, how long do you feel like this has been going on for? And then uh, following that, is this something you feel like you would you would want to get some support on? If they say yes, then we can look towards signposting because after that point, that's when we would be um, coaching the trauma, which is what we don't want to be doing. And for me, those those three questions are the kind of the um, the uh, the backbone of, of that conversation. Then, great. We've got seven minutes left, and I want to do a quick fire round, if we if I may, and then yes. finish off with just any closing comments. And I've just seen one. Apparently, I'm not getting messages from LinkedIn, so I'm going to read out this message, which was on LinkedIn. Um, any tips on how to coach without triggering your client when you know they've had trauma in the past, but you are coaching them on how to deal with anxiety in a particular work situation, which may have roots in their past trauma, but they want to deal with it in a very practical way now. Mm. Let me put that on screen just in case. It was, but it's a, I'm not sure if you'll be able to read it. It's a lot of words there. Um, but I think you've got the essence. And I just want to hear one or two answers. So anyone in particular want to pick that one up? Yep. Ditch the perfectionism. <laughs> What is, what Ditch the mean? perfectionism. Yeah, because uh, your your client can be uh, triggered at any time. Ditch the perfectionism. You you are doing fine. I assure you. Um, you um, you could ask if the client would be happy to share if they know what their triggers are, uh, and you can also ask the client um, if 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 they do if they are triggered and something happens, um, do they know what would help them? How could you help? Because uh, not knowing that is a, is a massive um, a massive uh, be benefit, but yeah, you you can't always know all the triggers, and they can potentially happen. That that makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much, Pete. I'm gonna. This one is a a very specific one. Is anyone familiar with rewind for trauma? Uh, I'm a little bit familiar with it. Um, I believe it's something the NHS I think have, have brought in for some of their staff as a. Um, if, if I'm thinking of the right one, I'm quite tired, so I could be wrong. But um, 
where basically it's it's a bit like trim. If anyone's ever heard of of trim practice, tra trauma recognition, I can't think what it is now. Um, where basically it's a way to uh, assess has someone experienced trauma, and then to be able to uh, sort of, um, support and signpost uh, in the short order. I believe that's what it is, but I'm doubting myself the more I talk. <laughs> no worries, Pete. Thank you. Um... This is a, a specific one, but curious on you, and maybe one or two people have a take on this. What to do with trauma about socialising versus staying home after pandemic time and isolation? I don't really understand the question. <laughs> no, that's what I was thinking. I'm not entirely I sure. Think, I think the problem with, of course, doing live is we don't get the full context and the people are typing. Yeah. Bit they can, but but I, I feel yeah. from the question, also from this overall conversation, that the answer's got to be surely to go back to your curiosity. It's, I mean, Pete, you were talking about the idea of what, what are the triggers, and it might be the same, just it's, it's a conversation, isn't it? It sounds like, yeah, you know, yeah absolutely, yeah. So, um, all, all I'd say if if you're speaking about yourself or you're speaking about somebody else, is just have a have a, have a chat with somebody, whether that is a um, a coach who is trauma informed, or potentially uh, some kind of therapist, a doctor, or something, just about what you're experiencing, um, how it's impacting, and what and what support is out there. But I'm afraid I can't be any more specific than that because I don't fully understand the the context of the question. Yeah, I understand. Great, thank you. Well, let's finish off with some closing statements. <laughs> Sounds very grandiose, doesn't it? A closing statement. Convince us, because B, you said at the end of this we were going to. What was that you said? We know <laughs> the difference between. <laughs> Yeah, I don't um, remember. Let's just, let's just uh, run, you know, finish off with a few what, what, final thoughts from you. What would you like to say to close off? Uh, I, I suppose I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so trauma isn't something to, to be feared in terms of speaking about it in a coaching context, but trauma is something to, to be aware of and to have an understanding of. I'm not expecting to be uh, an expert. Uh, so uh, be aware of it, understand it, um, and don't be... Yeah, and don't be afraid of, of speaking about it because speaking about trauma and by extension mental health is one of the most powerful things we can do generally. Mm, thanks, Pete. Mm. I want to second that. Um, and I'm glad that you raised that point, Nick, about, oh, now I'm scared that trauma might show up in all my coaching sessions. And that's certainly not the case. It does depend on the kind of uh, audience or uh, niche that we have. Um, so in certain groups of people, this might be more prevalent, uh, but the, the coach might expect that. Um, so it's certainly not a common um, um, challenge, but I would say that the the key things are, and also to answer the, the previous question, around staying in the present and working with whatever is happening in the present. So if a person is having a work-related issue, um, just working on that present situation without going um, in the past. And also just having that sensitivity because you are ultimately there with another human and uh, being able to, to acknowledge what they're going through um, and to be able to contain the space without panicking. or um, And sometimes we might need support such as trauma-informed um, training or supervision or another kind of um, support to make sure that we can do that in a way and, and still stay grounded um, and supportive for our client. Yeah, thanks, B. Okay. I was waiting for Doc, but um, yeah, I, I think um, I agree. Um, it's highly unlikely that within a coaching space you're going to regularly get people turning up that are being hugely triggered by trauma um so yes don't don't be afraid of it i think for me it's about how how thinking about how you create a safe environment and how do you create a safe relationship because that's the thing that is affected by trauma is that belief that the world is safe and that people are safe that really gets skewed when you've experienced trauma so if nothing else don't forget that you you are the asset in the room you are the resource in the room and just remember it's about relationship building yeah. ah damn so many good things have been said <laughs> already um yeah don't be afraid um you're doing really really valuable and important work being trauma informed has the potential to save lives uh, i'm not kidding about this 
Um, it's beautiful work. And sometimes you can see the client grow within the session, which is very rewarding. So, um, yeah, it's also very humbling, but in a good way, if you, if you get my gist. So, um, yeah. Um, and just because trauma is all around us, doesn't mean that you will see it in each and every session. I agree with that. Great, thank you. Thank you, everyone. That's it, our time is up. We got through all of our questions and we covered a whole load of other questions too. So thank you very much for all your expertise and your input and your warmth and your smiles and your nods and of gesticulations and your cats and everything else. Thank you so much, it's been an absolute pleasure. Have a great evening and good night, everyone. Thanks for watching, good night, cat. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>